So if I may ask everyone to assemble as quickly as possible. So welcome, welcome everyone. May I, I just a, a piece of, of, of order? Can I ask, may I ask everyone to turn off their cell phones now, just so we so as not to interrupt our uh, our guest this evening, this afternoon. Thank you very much. So welcome, welcome everyone to uh, the Maryland Global Leaders Speaker Series. We at the University of Maryland have a distinct advantage over other nationally recognized public flagship universities, and that is of course our location. By being inside the Beltway, just eight miles from the capital, we are particularly fortunate to be able to attract world leaders to our campus to speak to all of us on some of the most urgent matters facing our globe. Indeed, on account of our geography, our community gets to hear the voices of the world's change makers in ways and in frequency that are unique. Today, we have the privilege and honor of listening to the Honorable Ambassador Mayim Rashid Erekat, the Chief Representative of the Palestine Liberation Organization, the United States. There are many to thank here this afternoon um, to help, who have helped us make today's exciting event happen. The Center for International Development and Conflict Management, the School of Public Policy, the Gildenhorn Institute for Israel Studies, the Stamp Student Union Events, staff, and the Office of International Affairs. Allow me now just quickly to introduce you to Professor Jonathan Wilkenfeld, who will introduce today's speaker, Ambassador Eric. Well, on behalf of the Center for International Development and uh, International Development at the University of Maryland, I want to welcome all of you to this exciting event and say just a couple of words about the ambassador. I'm a firm believer that you should spend little time introducing people and more time actually listening to them. Um, ambassador Arakat currently serves, as uh, Ross said, as the chief representative of the Palestine Liberation Organization, or PLO, to the United States. Previously, he spent 11 years at the negotiation of, negotiations of Ferris Department of the PLO in Ramallah, most recently as Deputy Head and Coordinator General of that office. Ambassador Arhat also spent six years at Orient House, which is, as many of you know, the headquarters of the PLO in Jerusalem, and uh, as part of the Palestinian negotiation team at the Madrid Peace Talks. He took part in uh, Palestinian-Israeli negotiations at Beit Hanun, the Eras, Eras in Gaza, in Taba in Egypt in 1996 and in Jerusalem in 1997. Uh, and he was an official member of the Palestinian delegation to the Y River negotiations in 1998. Um, and he's not a newcomer to the United States, by the way. He uh, got his uh, undergraduate degree at uh, Arizona State University, has uh, spent some time uh, studying uh, at Harvard and uh, has been a frequent visitor to the United States uh, over the years. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Vanessa. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the University of Maryland for giving me this opportunity to speak to you today. And I agree with you, Professor not only shorter uh, introductions, but also shorter speeches, <laughs> because uh, politicians and diplomats tend to talk a lot and uh, achieve uh, very little. Uh, I mean, we are here today, I'm here today, uh, to discuss the current state of uh, the Palestinian-Israeli negotiations and touch also on the regional uh, de developments that are taking place, that have been taking place, as a matter of fact, for the last two years, and that how they impact uh, the prospects of reaching a peaceful resolution to the conflict between Israelis and Palestinians. The goal of ending the conflict, or the objective of ending the conflict with Israel, has been elusive for, for many years. Only uh, a month and a half ago, uh, you know, two months ago, as a matter of fact, 
we uh, marked the 20th anniversary of the signing of the Oslo Accords between the PLO and Israel on September 13, 1993. The agreement that was signed at the White House uh, was expected to uh, help the two parties to conclude uh, the negotiations uh, interim agreement and reach a final status uh, agreement between the two sides by, the, by May of 1999. And without going back, uh, talking about the developments that took place made this objective difficult to achieve, we are still 20 years later trying to find a solution uh, to this uh, uh, conflict. For, from a Palestinian uh, viewpoint, we continue to believe that the most ideal outcome of any political negotiations with Israel should be the creation of an independent, sovereign, contiguous uh, Palestinian state that can live side by side in peace and security with, with Israel on the 1967 borders, uh, in, which will include the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, East Jerusalem as the capital of the future Palestinian state, and of course resolving all the other outstanding issues between us and the Israelis, such as the refugees, Jerusalem, settlements, water, and security. Now, in 1988, we Palestinians have accepted the historic compromise for a resolution, which entailed the creation of a Palestinian state in the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, including East Jerusalem, that will create a state on 22% of what used to be historic Palestine. And uh, by doing so, uh, we thought that this would be uh, a strong incentive for the Israelis to accept that historic compromise on the part of the Palestinians and try to uh, put an end to this conflict once and for all. Unfortunately, today, the Israeli government continues to bargain with us and try to compromise with us on that historic compromise that we made in 1988. Meaning that instead of the 22% that we said we would accept to be a future Palestinian state, the Israelis are trying to compromise with us on the 22% while they want to continue to control what we call the attributes of sovereignty of any future independent Palestinian state, such as the airspace, the electromagnetic spheres, the international crossing points. Uh, they want to keep, off, of course, uh, uh, military presence, Israeli military presence in the future Palestinian states, issues that no Palestinian or Palestinian leader can accept because independence to us means ending the Israeli military occupation that started in 1967. Today, uh, the United States, Secretary of State Kerry, uh, backed by President Obama, are trying to uh, propel the two sides to move forward. We have accepted in July of this year to return to the negotiating table with the Israeli side for a period of six to nine months in order to reach an agreement with the Israelis to put an end to the conflict. The US role was, has been, continues to be very active, very engaged, and we have to give a lot of credit to Secretary of State Kerry, who is continuing to pay attention to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict at a time when there are so many crises uh, taking place in the Middle East and elsewhere. And even in the midst of his trips and, and, and the sh shuttle diplomacy from one area to another, he kept the focus on the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. He was there two weeks ago, true, to discuss with the Israelis uh, what could uh, uh, an Iran-US West agreement be, but also to focus on the Palestinian-Israeli uh, conflict. When we returned to the negotiations in July, we said that we expected Israel actually to uh, acknowledge that any future agreement will be based on the 1967 lines. And for Israel to freeze its settlement activities and to release 104 Palestinian prisoners who have been in Israeli jails since before the signing of the Oslo Accord in 1993. Prisoners that we, for the last 20 years, have been trying to get the Israelis to release because once we signed that peace agreement with them, 
they were expected to release their prisoners. They sat down with the leaders who gave instructions to those prisoners to carry, uh, carry out attacks against Israel. So the minute they sat down with the leaders who instructed them to attack Israel, it was only natural for the Israelis to release them. So we said 67 lines, freeze of settlements, and release of prisoners. Israel, of course, rejected uh, to uh, adhere to, to, to these demands. The United States ended up giving us assurances that whatever agreement in the future between us and the Israelis will be based on the creation of a Palestinian state on the 1967 borders. There were U.S. guarantees that were accepted by the Palestinian side. On the freeze of the settlement, the United States told us that they will continue to publicly make it clear to the Israelis that they do not recognize the legitimacy of Israeli settlements. Unfortunately, ever since we embarked on these negotiations, the rate of building settlements or announcing settlements uh, building has increased significantly. And the Israelis seem to be taking advantage of the return to negotiation. It's ironic that these announcements are much more than when there was no political process between us and the Israelis. When the political process was broken, and there were no context, political context whatsoever, Israel did not announce the same amount of uh, settlement tenders and bids the way they are doing it uh, today while we are talking to them. The, the settlement uh, activities are probably the most dangerous uh, element that could, still could undermine and torpedo this current uh, negotiation because for the Palestinians, we do not understand why the Israelis continue with building settlements, expanding existing settlements in areas that they and us know that we will take back to establish our Palestinian state on it. And for ordinary Palestinians, when they see this rate of settlement building increasing, their faith in the peaceful resolution continues to fade and their trust in a political resolution uh, continue uh, to be undermined. And therefore, the continuation of the building of settlements, the continuation of expansion of existing settlements, to us, is the single largest threat to the political process underway right now between us and uh, the Israelis. The other, the other problem that we are facing with the Israelis today is the refusal to define their future state. We are arguing with them on the 1967 borders. They refuse until today to give us clear idea about where they envision the borders of the state of Israel which will live side by side in peace and security with the state of Palestine. And the failure to do so uh, does not provide assurances to us that the Israelis are negotiating in good faith. They focus mostly on security. They believe that they have to first reach acceptable security arrangements before they can discuss the territorial uh, aspect of the negotiations. And we insist on the opposite, that you know, if you want me to uh, provide security assurances for you, I need to know what is my territory. How do you expect a party or a country to provide its neighbor, neighbors with assurances for, of their, for their security if they don't know what is the area, what is the territory that they will have control over. And for the last three months, we have been back and forth trying to get them to commit on the territorial uh, issue. And you know they, they have been uh, resistant to the idea of doing so before, uh, in, in their view, they can get uh, enough security assurances uh, that will encourage them to uh, make, in their words, territorial concessions. Of course, we don't consider them concessions because we consider uh, the, the areas under Israeli control to be occupied by international law. They are occupied by the uh, state of Israel. And when you, when you withdraw from that, you are not making any concessions. You're just giving the land back to its, to its, to its owners or to the, to the Palestinian people. And we have been very creative about uh, 
coming up with, with security arrangements that would be acceptable to the Israelis. We told the Israelis that we will accept whatever security arrangement that you want, short of the presence of a few, a military, a military Israeli presence in the future Palestinian state. Anything that Israel can come up with, including the introduction of third party uh, forces, multinational forces, NATO, anything, for whatever period, whatever functions, and in whatever location in the future Palestinian state, we are willing to accommodate that. But for them to keep their, the same military, the same army, that for the last 46 years has been violating the rights of the Palestinian people, humiliating the Palestinian people, intimidating the Palestinian people, restricting their movement, shooting them, killing them, you cannot turn an occupying power into a peacekeeping force. Never happened. It will never happen. So their insistence on keeping an army in the Jordan Valley, which constitutes 28% of the West Bank, by the way, is the breadbasket of the Palestinian, the future Palestinian state. For them to maintain an army on the Jordan River does not make any sense. From a security point of view, does not make any sense. Because if Israel keeps its army on the Jordan River, or if it kept it on the 1967 border, the threats against Israel will be the same. There are no marching armies today. There will be no marching armies from Iraq, no marching armies from Iran either. And therefore, any presence to try to prevent marching armies from the east to cross through Jordan to come to Israel does not make any sense, any sense from a security point of view. Any future threats against Israel, we all know, will come with, uh, very, uh, with, with not traditional uh, weapons, but rather you know, long-range missiles and, and other kind of weapons. It will not include marching armies there. So their argument that they have to be present in the Jordan Valley is only an attempt to try to consolidate their presence there and to prevent any future Palestinian state from being totally independent and sovereign. Something we Palestinians cannot accept, but we are willing to accept whatever security arrangement with guarantees from international parties to secure legitimate concerns, to secure the legitimate concerns of the state of Israel. We also do have legitimate security concerns. After all, Israel is, it has the sixth or the seventh largest army in the world, and they have proven nuclear weapons. And we are the Palestinians, actually, who should be asking Israel for security guarantees, not the other way around. But still, we are willing to work with them in order to satisfy their legitimate security concerns. Now, what will happen after the nine-month period? A lot of people have already issued their judgments that the current political uh, negotiations have failed. I cannot say that they did fail. I think it's still too early uh, to uh, say that they failed. They are not making the progress that we have been hoping that they will make, but we still have five more months, six more months to go. And I hope with, uh, with active involvement and engagement by the United States and the international community, we still can push the Palestinians and the Israelis forward in order to uh, reach a formula, reach an agreement that will be acceptable to both and will satisfy the needs and the concerns of two sides. Now, if things don't work until, let's say, April, May, we made it clear to the United States and to everybody that we continue to reserve the right to resort to whatever venues and forums in order, and for, in order to uh, try to put an end to the Israeli occupation, military occupation of our people. Now, if you want me to elaborate more, yes, it will include joining United Nations and international organizations in order to hold Israel accountable and reliable for their actions in the occupied Palestinian territories. The status quo, in our view, is not sustainable. We are not in this process for another 20 years. Israel continues to swallow the land. Israel continues to build settlements. Israel continues to change the status quo of Jerusalem. Israel continues to turn 
its, its eyes away from the violence that is being perpetrated on a daily basis by settlers in Palestinian villages and towns. And we cannot, as a leadership, continue to fool our people and say, this process is working, just be patient 20 more years. In 20 more years, in two more years, in one more year, there may be not an option for a two-state solution. We continue to be strategically committed to the two-state solution because we believe this is the best outcome for any current political uh, negotiations. But the way Israel is behaving today, it is Israel that is pushing this situation to a one binational state. It's not the Palestinians who are doing that. And I don't believe that this is what Israel wants uh, in, 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 as a result of, of, of this, uh, you know, as Israel as an ultimate goal, I don't think they want to see a binational state where discrimination will be rampant against Palestinian and other minorities inside, inside that binational state. So we continue to hope that the, ne the next six months will produce an outcome that will be acceptable by both, but I think time is, is running out and Palestinians don't have the luxury to engage in yet another long process to talk about our, our, our process about process and not about peace because we cannot afford to allow Israel to continue to kill our dream of being independent and being free. Now, we are talking about the Palestinian-Israeli conflict at a time when the region actually is boiling. It's interesting to, uh, to see the shifts and the realignments that are taking uh, shape in, in, in the region. We, from the beginning, told the Israelis, you don't have, uh, you, you cannot afford to just watch events unfold in the region. You cannot say that we have to wait until the, 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 the dust settles down before we can engage the Palestinians and end the conflict with them. Oh, I don't know if President So or King So will be in power in, in two years. So how do you expect me to make peace, to make agreement with, with governments and rulers who may not be there? I mean, you know, they may be true about the fact that we are witnessing changes in the region. But Israel has an option of being a bystander, watching things unfold and unravel, and not being able to influence it, and be an, an active player in trying to shape how things are, 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 are transforming themselves in the region. If they want to sit on the sidelines and just watch things, they will, they will be bystanders for a long time to come. And they will not be able to influence the events that are happening in the region. What happened in Egypt is an example. What is happening in Syria is another example. I mean, Nobody knows who will take over in Syria. Nobody knows who will the rulers of Syria will be in, in two years or three years or four years. Whether they will be friendlier to Israel or more hostile, I think they will be more hostile, to be honest with you. I don't think they will be more uh, friendlier uh, to, to, to the Israelis. You have a Palestinian leadership, a, pragma a pragmatic Palestinian leadership that despite the internal opposition, and we do have an opposition. Not only Israel has an opposition, but we do have an opposition. Despite the strong opposition, continues to be committed to the two-state solution and to the peaceful resolution of the conflict. And the majority of the Arab countries, Egypt, Jordan, the Gulf countries, are still committed to ending the conflict with Israel and normalizing relations with Israel based on the Arab Peace Initiative of 2002 if Israel accepts to withdraw from occupied Palestinian, Syrian, Lebanese territories and end the conflict with the Palestinian people by allowing them to establish their own state. The Arabs, 57 Arab and Muslim countries, including Iran, are willing to normalize relationship with Israel. This initiative has been on the table since 2002. What have the Israelis done about it? Nothing. They are not interested in ending the conflict with 50, 57 Arab and Muslim countries. They continue to want to control the land and they want to continue to have the conflict with their neighbors and with the rest of the Arab and Muslim countries. So Israel today is making a major mistake by watching events unfold, unravel, 
without taking serious steps to end their conflict with the Palestinians, which will open the door for them to play an active role in shaping the future of the region. Israel cannot continue to look westward. They have to look eastward. If they want to continue to be in that part of the world for years to come, they have to accept the fact that they are part of the Middle East. And they have to accept the fact that they are surrounded by Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, Jordan, Egypt, and then the rest of the, uh, the Arab and Muslim countries to the west and to the east. They cannot pretend to be in Europe. They cannot. 20 years from today, they are going to wake up and see the Syrians their neighbors, and the Lebanese their neighbors, and the Palestinians their neighbors. Because none of us is planning to leave. So they need to, they need to come to grab, you know, the opportunity that exists today and assert themselves as part of that transformation that is taking shape in the Middle East. Stop thinking about the past. Don't live in the past. If we want to live in the past, we won't be talking to them. If we want to listen to people who are saying that we have given up 78% of what used to be historic Palestine in order to end this conflict with them, we will not be talking to them. But for them to continue to live in the past and talk about 2,000 years ago, their minister of economy, Naftali Bennett, he grabs a coin from his pocket the other day showing 2,000 years old coin. The Canaanites were there for 4,000 years. The Romans were there. The Persians were there. The Philistines were there. Everybody were there. Does not give you the right to claim that this land belongs to you and the others who lived there also as well as you did don't have the right to live there. This is something that they need to understand. The fact that they have roots there does not give them the right to exclude other minorities and other peoples who are who have been living in that land continuously for thousands of years to come. So the region is in total transformation. The West, <coughs> US, I expect them to have a deal with Iran soon. Israel is not happy about that because if Iran is no longer a threat, what would Netanyahu use? What excuse he will use for not moving forward? No chemical weapons in Syria. The Iraqi army and Iraq has been fragmented and destroyed. If the Iranians accept to limit their nuclear program, by peaceful means, why not? What's the alternative? Another war? Does the American people, or do the American people want another war in the region? You can start the war, but you can never end it. And from the experiences in Afghanistan and Iraq, who wants to embark on another, another war? And we all know Israel cannot attack Israel on its own. We all know that. Somebody called it the bluff of the century, that Netanyahu threatened to attack Iran. They knew that he cannot attack Iran. But he bluffed, and the West and the United States accepted, uh, you know, believed his bluff, and imposed sanctions against Iran. Now that we have the chance to solve the conflict peacefully, Israel is opposed? Why? Why do you want to start another war that could be destructive for everybody in the region? So this re realignment in the relationship between the West and Iran could have a positive impact on what is happening in the region in terms of Iranian influence in certain countries and groups in the region, including Hezbollah and Hamas, Syria, of course, and in terms of calming the fears of Israel about any future threat from Iran. It should provide a better atmosphere for Israel to engage with the Palestinians and to try to end the conflict. And all these shifts and realignments in the region will continue for years to come. Look at Iran-Turkey now. Turkey and Iran were at odds until recently. Now they are back talking again. Egypt and Russia. The, Russia, the Egyptians are once again opening the door uh, with, with Russia for 40 years, almost 40 years. The Egyptians did not have strong relationship with Russia. Now, as a result of what happened in Egypt, the Muslim Brotherhood taken over, 
the army taking over after that and the, the, the perception that the United States helped the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, the Egyptians now are once again opening the door for the Russians in, in the region. If the Russians can have Egypt again, I mean, they will become more flexible on Syria. So all, all these realignments that are taking place uh, are going to be interesting to, to watch. Uh, I want to conclude by saying that neither us Palestinians nor Israelis have the luxury to wait another 10, 15 years for these transformations to take shape. I think it will be too late for the two-state solution. It could be too late for coexistence between Israelis and Palestinians in 10, 15 years. So this is the time for the important decisions. We don't need any more rounds of negotiations. They know and we know what are the parameters of a solution to the conflict between the Israelis and Palestinians. What we need is courageous, brave, and resolute decisions in order to put an end to this conflict once and for all. Thank you very much. Mr. Ambassador, thanks so much for your comments there. We're really indebted to you and for your agreeing to take questions from the audience. And uh, let me ask you to think about questions you might have. Let me lead off with one. Uh, you mentioned that you thought the time was getting very short, in particular the next five to six months that we had a need for something to happen. Do you have a sense of about what the best first step might be to begin moving in the direction that you think would be most positive? Well, I think, I think what, we, what we need to see is a change in the Israeli mentality, which is not happening as we were hoping and expecting. Israel continues to negotiate with us based on, of course, the wrong assumption that the existing status quo can be preserved for years to come. Now, internally, Israel is enjoying a very pros prosperous economy. They are more secure than they have been, uh, than they have ever been before. And thanks to the Palestinians for, for, for partially for that effort. And I'm not going to take credit for everything. And they believe that we can wait for the Palestinian to resolve the Palestinians. It's not, it's not a top priority. And unless they start to look beyond tomorrow and think about the impact of all these changes that are taking place, it will be very difficult. So we want to see a significant fundamental change in the Israeli attitude and mentality, that this current status quo cannot be preserved. Thank you. Questions? Yes, sir. And if, yes, you come here and if you just uh, give your name if you would and your question. My name is Morty. Um, how do you envision the reconciliation between Fatah and Hamas over the next few months as the peace process moves forward? Well, uh, I mean, unfortunately, the divisions continue between the Palestinians. Uh, I, I don't, I don't, again, unfortunately, I don't see any prospects of moving forward in terms of ending uh, these divisions anytime uh, soon. We did agree in 2011 uh, with Hamas in, in Doha, in Qatar, under the sponsorship of the Qataris, we reach an agreement that called for uh, elections, national elections to elect a president, legislative council, and Palestine National Council, and forming uh, a national consensus government as a caretaker before these elections to prepare for the elections. Hamas, unfortunately, does not want elections. They don't want to hold elections. They want to form this national consensus government but they don't want to agree on holding uh, elections. And this has been uh, a point of contention between the PLO and, and Hamas. Uh, listen, I mean, we disagree with Hamas. We disagree with their tactics. And we try uh, vigorously to, you know, to, to push them to change their tactics, saying, you know, hey, the PLO at one point resorted to military struggle. And we today believe that the only way to resolve the conflict is through, through peaceful political means. We cannot resolve it militarily. And we're telling the Israelis the same thing. Don't rely on your 
power of military might to try to resolve the conflict with the Palestinians because it's not going to work. Let's all use the logic, uh, the power of logic versus the logic of power. And uh, we, we try to convince Hamas to accept that the only way to do it is through political uh, means. So if they decide to join the PLO, which they are not a member today, they have to accept the political program of the PLO. And the political program of the PLO is very clear. Peaceful resolution to the conflict, two-state solution, non-violence, etc., etc., etc. I hope the day will come soon when Hamas will accept this program and join the PLO. Thank you. Question. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm Tamar. Um, so you agree that um, that Hamas and Fatah are at ends and are at odds, and you agree that uh, Hamas's tactics are not desirable. Um, considering this, it makes sense to me that Israel's primary uh, concern is for their security, because how can they engage in peaceful uh, in a peace in a process for peace if they are only working with one faction of the political leadership, and that's the faction that wants to work with them, but they cannot engage with somebody that wants to destroy them. <laughs> I, 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 can this, I can ask this question to the, to the Israelis as well, because uh, it's very obvious that this current Israeli coalition uh, includes members who are clearly, obviously, publicly opposed to any peace agreement with the Palestinians, and who are advocating more settlement expansion, and even some of them, uh, the Foreign Minister Lieberman uh, at one point called for the transfer of Palestinians out of their land. So, uh, in the end, you have the PLO being recognized as the sole legitimate representative of the Palestinian people. Even when Hamas was in power in 2007, they acknowledged that the negotiations and, and you know, pursuing a negotiated settlement between the Palestinians and the Israelis is the responsibility of the PLO and not the responsibility of, of uh, the Palestinian Authority. Now, we do have uh, different factions who do not agree. The majority of the Palestinian people are in favor of the two-state solution, as well as the majority of the Israeli people. So you have a majority on both sides calling for a two-state solution. Unfortunately, in the case of Israel, it's a vocal, strong minority that is dictating the policies of the state of Israel today. Uh, you know, this minority which is, you know, advocating, promoting more settlements, uh, opposition to, to any peace agreement uh, with, with the Palestinians. And the sad thing is that the Prime Minister is, is becoming a hostage to this vocal minority in, in, in their opposition to reaching an agreement uh, uh, with, with the Palestinians. On the issue of security, I think the best way, and this is what I tell my Israeli friends when I, when I talk to them, I say, why does the day after has to have to be similar to the day before, after we reach a peace agreement? Why do you Israelis always think about the day after as being a day when Palestinians, all what they want to do instead of going to school and work and do their own things, just go start collecting missiles and fire them on Israel? Why can't we think of the day after as being a day that will usher the dawn of peace and coexistence between the two sides. Once we resolve the political differences, once the Israeli military occupation is ended, why would the Palestinians want to continue to attack Israel or create problems for Israel? And why would the Israeli army and settlers would want to continue to attack Palestinian civilians and shoot, shoot at them? We look at the day after as of a new chapter in the relationship between us and the Israelis. And once we reach an agreement, we are going to ask the Palestinian people to vote in a referendum, to give their approval of whatever agreement. And I believe the Israelis have also uh, you know, committed to do the same. So if we can get a good agreement for both sides that would enjoy the support of the majority of the Israelis and the Palestinians, then we can be sure that whatever will follow will be something new in terms of the relationship between the two sides. Next question. 
Uh, Haviva is my name. Um, so you said that Palestine is willing to accept security terms from Israel. So for the two-state solution, Israel has been calling for a dematerialized Palestinian state. And my question is, how would Palestine go about accommodating this term? And further than that is, can you envision an independent state that is dematerialized? Like, do those two things go hand? I'm sure in this in the audience here many professors of international relations. I, I never, I, I don't think the word demilitarized is is the, it should be non-militarized. I, I don't think demilitarized describes it. Demilitarized, you can't have any single piece of weapon. That's demilitarized. A demilitarized zone, that is a zone that no weapons exist or or are found in, in, in that zone. What we accepted to uh, to be in the future is. I think a state with limited military capabilities, uh, a strong police force, strong national guard to be able to provide security to our own people and to be able to protect our borders. If you want to protect our borders, you need a very strong border guards or national guards, you know, to be able to do to do the job. You cannot expect the future Palestinian state to be totally uh, demilitarized. I think we. Uh, today, we do have some armored vehicles, we do have uh, uh, machine guns. Uh, uh, we did have before uh, 2000, in the fact that in 2000, we did have helicopters as well. Uh, we have armored vehicles that were uh, donated uh, to us by the Russians that are still in Jordan, but the Israelis have refused to allow them in. So I think we are going to need a strong police force, strong National Guard force in order to maintain law and order protect the borders within our future Palestinian state. There's no such thing as totally demilitarized. Thanks much. Thanks. Your question. Assalamu um, like, My name is Aram. I have a question. The PLO is, you know, they trust the United States and stuff, but how is that possible when Israel is basically funded by the United States? Well, I mean, listen, uh, we, we, we very much acknowledge the fact that uh, the United States enjoys a very special relationship with Israel. And uh, we are not in the business of changing that relationship. I think, uh, on the contrary, the fact that the United States has a special relationship with Israel could work in favor of you know, reaching uh, an agreement. Now, I know that there are certain forces in this country and certain lobby, lobbying groups and certain members of Congress who uh, are not uh, working in that direction to help the administration uh, reach an agreement uh, and, and resolve the conflict, but uh, I believe that the fact that the United States provides Israel, forget the financial and the military support, and we know, you know, it's billions of dollars in the financial support and, and uh, uh, the military support, but the political support that the United States is providing Israel is more important than the military and the financial because this, the support they are providing them at the United Nations, the support they are providing them at international organizations, is actually shielding Israel today from being held accountable for many of the violations of international law and the human rights that they, they are committing against the Palestinian people under occupation. So this is what we would like to see change. We don't want the United States to change its relationship with Israel. We want the United States to hold Israel accountable for its actions and for its behavior. That if they do something wrong, if they violate international law, if they do something contrary to US policies, they should be held accountable. And they should not be acting with impunity and, and knowing in advance that the United States will shield them from the international community and the punishment of the international community. I think as long as the United States continue, continues to provide Israel unlimited support, blind support, Israel does not have an incentive to reach an agreement with the Palestinians. Only when they know that the, the, the United States will hold them accountable would the Israelis reconsider and, and rethink uh, their, their position. But today, they believe that they can do anything and not being held accountable. And this is what matters to us. Continue giving them the support you want to give them, but you need to explain to them that their actions are also hurting uh, the United States standing in the region, 
and the prospects of reaching a peaceful resolution to the conflict with the Palestinians and the Arabs in the Middle East. Mr. Ambassador, our next question is over here. Over here. Yeah, absolutely. Hi, my name is Tatiana. First of all, thank you so much for coming. Um, you had mentioned that the Israelis will not pull out of the settlement, and that's sort of the obstacle to peace. But how do you reconcile the fact that in the past there have been several offers by the Israeli government to pull out of the disputed territories, and even in 2005 they unilaterally pulled out of Gaza, and yet the Palestinian Authority has at times rejected Israel's offers to pull out of the disputed territories in hope of peace? Well, first of all, they are not disputed territories. I mean, uh, this is this is not where they are occupied territories. So what did you just say? I missed it. I'm sorry? Just a question, if you could just repeat what you oh, just repeat said. Oh, repeat the question. She, she, she said, uh, how come we refused in the past Israel offers to pull out from disputed territories? And uh, she mentioned the 2005 disengagement from the Gaza Strip and, you know, as an example of Israel's uh, good intentions, maybe that's what she meant. Uh, well, first of all, they are not disputed territories, they are occupied territories by law, by international law. UN resolutions, United States consider them to be occupied territories. So this disputed is an Israeli word. You, you, you have a dispute over something that you think it belongs to you. But when you are occupying a territory and it is, it is, it was acquired by military force, it's not disputed, it's occupied. So I wanted to make this uh, observation first before proceeding to answer your question. Uh, Israel, in, uh, let's, let's talk about Camp David in 2000. Israel, the offer that Israel made, the generous offer that Israel made at the time, was generous compared to previous Israeli offers. So it was not acceptable to the Palestinians because they wanted to swap land at the ratio of 9 to 1 for each square kilometer that they want to, uh, for each nine square kilometers they want to take from the Palestinians, they want to give us one square kilometer. They wanted to continue to control our airspace and electromagnetic sphere. We cannot control our airspace. Water resources, international crossing points, permanent military presence, early warning systems, rapid deployment force that can be introduced into the Palestinian state if they sense any danger against them and without authorization from the Palestinians. If I tell any logical, reasonable person that this is what Israel is offering me, of course, the refugees and Jerusalem were not discussed because we could not reach an agreement on that. But this is the offer from other areas. How do you expect any Palestinian with, 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 with any, any, any level of sanity, sanity to, to accept an offer by the Israelis that will keep us under their control forever. That's why Camp David failed, because what Israel offered was not acceptable to the Palestinians. It's not because the Palestinians refused. And by the way, none of these offers were made in writing. None of them. As a matter of fact, and maybe this is the first time you will hear that, the only written proposal that was submitted during the Camp David talks in 2000 was a paper by the Palestinians to the Israelis on the refugees. And until today, 13 years later, the Israelis did not respond to that paper. The only written proposal that was submitted at Camp David 2000, which was you know, hosted by President Clinton in the presence of Chairman Arafat and Ehud Barak, the Prime Minister of Israel, the only written proposal was submitted by the Palestinian side on the issue of refugees and the Israelis did not respond to it. So there was no written offer by the Israelis. Same thing we heard during the talks between Prime Minister Olmert and President Abbas, the Olmert offer. And I keep hearing that from journalists here in Washington. And I say, please, I beg you, get me a copy of that offer. I would love to see that offer that you are talking about. There's no such offer. There, was never, there has never been a written offer. An offer does not become official unless it is put in writing. You know that. Some of you must be studying legal. And, and, uh, you cannot accept a, a verbal offer. So Israel was not actually uh, you know, making any, any offers to the Palestinians 
that were acceptable or met the minimum demands. But Israel has a much stronger uh, machine to uh, paint the Palestinians as a side who rejected these offers and refused to reciprocate and, 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 and etc., etc. On the Gaza disengagement, I was, I was involved, we were involved in that, and uh, we told the Israelis, we said, do not do it unilaterally. You do not do it unilaterally. Because if you do it unilaterally, you will play into the hands of other factions among the Palestinians who have been advocating military struggle and resistance to brag and say that their tactics contribute to the Israeli withdrawal. And that the Palestinian leadership which is talking to, who is talking to you is not, is, not, is not partner with you. And the Israelis refused. Prime Minister Sharon insisted that he wanted to take unilateral action. And do you know why he did it? He did it because his advisors told him that the international community, including the United States, are preparing to put a proposal or a plan on the table for all the parties to accept. So they told him, unless you make something, some, a political move that is significant, you will be, a, a solution will be imposed on Israel. And that's why he did it. His, his, his advisor, Dov Weissglass, said that, not me. And that's why they did the unilateral withdrawal from the Gaza Strip. They, why do they want the Gaza Strip? They only had 4,000 settlers in the Gaza Strip. And they have 1.2, 1.3 million Palestinians. To them, it was a very advantageous move. They didn't do it because they cared about the Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. They wanted to move out because attacks were taking, taking place against Israeli soldiers. You know, soldiers were killed and wounded in, in, in there. And it's only 4,500 settlers, 4,200, 4,500 settlers. So to them, it was strategically sound to move and to deflect pressure from the international community and the United States to impose any political solution on them. And we told them, the minute you will move out of the Gaza Strip, certain factions will fill the void. And if you don't do it in coordination with us, the Palestinian Authority, we are not going to be able to play a positive role in turning the withdrawal into something that we can capitalize on. And look at the situation in Gaza today. A big jail, 1.6 million Palestinians besieged by the Israelis, and, you know, suffering from very, very dire uh, human uh, humanitarian conditions. And the Israeli occupation of the Gaza Strip technically is not over. They continue to control uh, the, the, the land passages, uh, the territorial water, the airspace. So basically, technically, uh, Gaza, the Gaza Strip is still under the Israeli military occupation. The next question, Mr. Ambassador. My name is Jonas. Uh, what opportunities do you see, or do Palestinian leaders see in the changing Middle East? You talked a little bit about what Israel sees, what the opportunities mm -hmm. Israel has, but what about the, the Palestinian leadership? Well, we, because of the fact that we are under the Israeli military occupation uh, and the fact that we still don't have control, total control over our destiny in terms of movement, in terms of sovereignty and things like that, the, the, the focus of the Palestinian people is not, is not on, the, on, on our government or our, our political system because they understand that we do not have yet uh, the, the full um, uh, uh, authorities and, and jurisdiction and control over our land. So, uh, you know, we are part of the larger Middle East, but our situation is a little bit different because of the fact that we have a struggle with the military occupation and we are trying to obtain freedom and independence. So, uh, in a way that reduces the pressure on our, our government and our leadership because the people understand that, and I'm not, I'm not someone who blames all our ills on the, on the military occupation on Israel. I think we have our own ills that we created and invented ourselves and we can treat them and remedy them, you know, that we have our, we are not perfect, you know, and therefore, uh, but, but people understand that economically, in particular, the World Bank just issued uh, a recent report in which they said that Israel's control over Area C of the West Bank, which is 61% of the total area of the West Bank, 
Israel control of that area is preventing the Palestinians from a potential uh, revenue of 3.4 billion dollar a year. And imagine, I mean, our our uh, our our budget or our you know GDP is is five billion dollars. You know, so when you talk about 3.4 billion, imagine how much that will help the Palestinian economy. Had we have uh, have we had the chance to control that uh, that area? So economically, uh, many of our problems are because of the restrictions uh, that Israel imposes on the Palestinians in terms of freedom of movement of goods, services, and people. But uh, there are other issues that Israel has nothing to do with, you know, and therefore, uh, uh, you know, that that helps in a way to isolate us from what is happening in Israel. But we we get affected because. In Syria, we have 600,000 Palestinian refugees. In the Yarmouk uh, refugee camp near Damascus, 160,000 Palestinian refugees lived there before the start of the civil war there. Today, only 10 to 15,000 are living there. Where and is the rest, the rest moved in within Syria, some of them to Lebanon. Unfortunately, Jordan closed the doors because you know the demographic balance in Jordan is very delicate. You know, two thirds of Jordan is Palestinian, and they didn't want the influx of more refugees into Jordan. But we expect even the 10 to 15,000 in their work, uh, refugee camp to be to be evicted soon, you know, because it's a battlefield between the, the government and the opposition. And uh, Lebanon, the same thing. We have 400,000 Palestinian refugees in Lebanon. So anything that happened in the surrounding areas impact us. And therefore, uh, we may not be directly involved in what is happening. And we have taken a very, very a balanced approach to all these problems by saying we don't interfere in the internal affairs of the neighboring countries. The reason we are doing that is because we have a lot to lose if we take sides in this conflict. And we have paid a heavy price in the past by taking sides. So we try to be to be to be neutral in, in what is happening, but at the same time support whatever the people of Syria, whatever the people of Egypt, whatever the people of Libya they, they want in terms of, of being being free, having a democratic uh, government, etc., etc., etc. I have a question over here, Mr. Ambassador. Hi, my name is Sandra, and I was just wondering when you referenced in your uh, talk about reaching out to the United Nations and the international community. Um, I mean, Israeli actions are already in violation of UN resolutions, and the international community does call them out, even if it doesn't really lead to change. So I was wondering if you could explain what your um, courses of action that are left with the international community are. Like, how could we use the UN if we tried to use the UN and it hasn't really worked? Well, most most of the most of the UN resolutions pertaining to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict uh, uh, do not uh, include. And uh, correct me here, uh, uh, chapter uh, chapter 11, I believe. Uh, not chapter 11, sorry, what is the chapter that uh, calls for using, uh, using force if the country does not uh, implement the, the UN Charter? There is a chapter something, chapter 6, 7? Chapter 7, thank you. Chapter 11 is bankruptcy, right? <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've never done that, but I think that's what... Uh, uh, chapter 7, which, which calls on the United Nations to, uh, to enforce the implementation of the agreement. In the case of Israel, unfortunately, <coughs> I mean, Israel has defied, I don't know how many, but it, you're talking about dozens of UN uh, Security Council resolutions, including some that were uh, also approved by, by the United States uh, as, as part of the five member Security Council. So they are, they are, uh, they are basically ineffective. And they cannot uh, force Israel into uh, implementing them. So, uh, what what we what we did last year when we joined the United Nations, we tried in 2011 to join the United Nations as a full member uh, state. Unfortunately, the United States uh, uh, lobbied against our efforts and convinced even uh, the you know eight members of the 15, the 15 Security Council members, the five permanent and the ten non-permanent. We needed an eight. Uh, we needed eight countries in order, or eight members, in order to get the quorum needed to take it to a, a vote at the UN Security Council, which we of course expected the, UN to, uh, the US to veto. You know, we didn't, we, we didn't expect the US to approve it. But the United States 
uh, didn't want even that, didn't want our bid or our effort to reach to that point, so they, they torpedoed that by um, lobbying uh, uh, 8 out of 15 to, to vote against it. And when that was in 2011, 2012, we went to, uh, to become a non-member state, which uh, was only United Nations General Assembly vote, and we obtained 138 with 44, 42 or 44 abstentions. If you count the abstentions to 138, you're talking about 183, 84, who are basically approving Palestinian uh, uh, membership. Uh, they're the only countries that opposed, you know, the only significant countries were Israel, United States, Canada, Czech Republic, and maybe Panama, I think, I'm not sure, I think uh, so. So the rest are islands somewhere in the Indian Ocean. <laughs> I don't know their names. Uh, but uh, interestingly, two days ago, Palestine, for the first time, voted in a vote held at the United Nations and voted in choosing judges for the International Court of Justice. So we are exercising certain privileges given to us as a result of being a non member state, but not the full. Now, had we won full membership in 2011, we would have qualified automatically to be members of all UN-related and international organizations, including the International Criminal Court, the International Court of Justice, the only two uh, organizations that Israel is, is, is very concerned about. They don't care about the rest. UNESCO, unfortunately, both US and Israel shot themselves in the head, and they quit UNESCO. You know, uh, because we joined UNESCO. I mean, I, I don't understand how the United States can serve its interests by protesting the inclusion of Palestine by suspending its own programs around the world through UNESCO. And they both were, uh, were, were suspended because Israel and the United States did not pay their dues to uh, the, this international organization. So we, if we wanted full membership, we would have qualified automatically. Now, we need to uh, submit a request to join these organizations. But given the support we have at these organizations, we are not worried about becoming members of these organizations. This is something, it's not a secret. We have all the letters of accession to the 63 international organizations ready. All that we need to change is the date. We, 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 we've prepared them six, seven months ago. What we need to do is change the date. The minute this process falls apart, the minute we find out that Israel is dealing with us with the same mentality, taking us for a ride, continuing to impose facts on the ground and to preempt the creation of a Palestinian state, we will join these international organizations. At that point, it will be a different situation than the situation we are in today. Mr. Ambassador, our time is drawing to a close, but I want to ask one very short last question. We have an international study group that's going to both Israel and Jordan in January. And I was wondering, what is it that if you had to pick anything that you'd hope that they would come back having learned from their visit to the Middle East? Why aren't you including the Palestinian uh, territories? I mean, why aren't you including yeah, And part of it is just it's a short time and there will be opportunities to be able to, to engage. But I, 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 think if you, I think if you can create time to include it, even even for a day, it would be it would be important because how can you get a sense of what is happening if you're not seeing the Palestinian areas and, and seeing the Palestinians? Jordan, of course, Jordan is an Arab country, neighbor country. But uh, if you're going to Israel, I think you should see uh, what is happening in in, uh, in, the, in the Palestinian areas. You reminded me of, of of an incident that took place once. I was flying from from London to Tel Aviv. That's during the good days when the Israelis allowed us to travel through their airports. And uh, an Israeli was sitting next to me. Uh, I usually like to read on the plane. I don't like to talk. And I get nervous sometimes from the turbulences. So I looked, he looked at me. We looked at I said, we talked. And he looked at me. He said, where are you from? I said, I'm your neighbor. <laughs> he said, oh, Jordan? <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, what happened to that piece of land before Jordan? I mean, you know, with the West Bank, I said, I'm, I'm, I'm from the West Bank, I'm Palestinian from Ramallah. So he completely 
you know, jumped over to Jordan. And you know, this is this is tells you that that Israelis maybe are still not prepared. While we Palestinians have come a long way to accept Israel, and we are saying Israel until today. Do you see the word Palestine on any of the maps in Israel? Do you see Israeli leaders clearly saying that the Palestinian people have the right to have a state of their own on their land, like we have said in 1993, 1988, 1996? And we clearly and equivocally recognize Israel's right to exist. Why can't they do the same thing? So, uh, I mean, the visit, the visit is important, but I wish, if you still have time, that you can squeeze even a day to go to the Palestinians, because with all your respect, if you don't see the Palestinian and the Palestinian areas and talk to them, you will get a, a good idea about what's going on, but it will be half what you need to know. Yeah. Mr. Ambassador, thank you so much. Thank you. All token of our thanks, we want to leave this, this special remembrance of, of Maryland with thanks for, for your contribution to our understanding and to our dialogue here today. Mr. Ambassador, thank you so much.